what we seem to have found from experiments and from theorizing is that there is an unavoidable element of chance in the way the world changes from moment to moment. The universe evolves in some very real sense according to a throw of the dice. We're used to things uh, being in one place at one time. But that can we kind of feel comfortable with that. And yet, you have entanglement. Mm -hmm. Well, Brian, why don't you walk us through entanglement a little bit? Because it's, uh, there's, that's one of the great weirdnesses of the quantum world. Sh sure, I'm happy to. Uh, the timing's a little awkward because I just put a cough drop in my mouth, but I'll... <laughs> <laughs> you know what's amazing but, uh, is I now we'll have one in my roll. mouth. We'll give it a roll anyway. It's in a... <laughs> Isn't that... It's in both places at once in Hilbert's space. Particles can have a property known as spin. Particles can kind of spin around like a top. And if they spin, say, counterclockwise, we say they're spinning up. And if they're spinning clockwise, we say they're spinning down. So they can be spinning up or they can be spinning down. Einstein and his colleagues found that you could have two particles, set them up in such a way that each of them is in this funny mixture of both spinning up and spinning down, 50% chance of each. That's the weirdness of quantum mechanics. 50% up, 50% down. And you can take one of these particles, put it in a box, bring it way over here, say in New York, take the other particle, put it in another box, bring it over to California. So here they are, each in this fuzzy mixture of both spinning up and spinning down. You go over to the box in New York and you open it up and the particle snaps to attention. Say it snaps up. It knows it's being looked at, measured. What Einstein and his colleagues found from the math was it said that at the very moment that you open the box in New York and find it spinning up, the one in California also snaps to attention, spinning down, even though it's 3,000 miles away, you didn't do anything to it. In the reverse experiment, go over to the one in California, open the box and say it's spinning up. At that moment, the math says the one in New York should spin down, even though there's no connection between them. Einstein called this spooky. Spooky action at a distance. You do something over here and it somehow affects something over there. And his hope in some sense was that this was such a crazy implication of quantum theory that if the people who were in favor of it learned about this feature, they'd say, oh, there must be something wrong. How could you tell? Well, you wanted to actually do the experiment. You know, this is just math at the moment. You couldn't do the experiment in the 30s when this was really put forward. 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, you can do it. By the 80s, you could do it. And people did the experiment. And just as quantum theory predicted, this guy spins up, that guy spins down. This guy spins up, that guy spins down. Einstein pointed out um, uh, this non-locality, um, this phenomenon of entanglement. Um, it's not exactly true that his attitude was, as soon as people hear about this, they're going to say, oh, it's crazy, and they're going to abandon quantum mechanics. He thought he had a strict logical argument, OK, that if you made certain assumptions that sounded plausible, he had a proof from this phenomenon of entanglement that quantum mechanics must be incomplete as a description of what's really going on. And Bohr's reaction to it was an interesting, curiously philosophical reaction to a very concrete scientific argument. Bohr essentially says something like, you know, this word really, what's really going on, I don't like that word so much. <laughs> um, that's kind of old fashioned. It's a little bit nerdy to be, to be all, all in, a, in a fuss about knowing what's really going on. Um, it's, time to get, it's time to get beyond that. Um, it's time to, it, it's time to, to learn that there are certain kinds of questions about what's really going on, that it's naive or old-fashioned or archaic or somehow. So, but where are you? On, where are you along this spectrum? I'm, I'm with Einstein on this yeah. spectrum. Um, th those are the only questions at the end of the day worth asking. I think the fact that different f physicists 
have slightly different viewpoints about this is not a weakness of us as a community, but a strength. Because we will all work harder on the things we're excited about. And it's much better that we bark up many trees than that we all bark up the same tree, right? And I think, I think you'll agree with me, for instance, that many extremely practical discoveries that were made, which were useful and hey, even made money, like computers, were made because someone had, was really passionate about some philosophical question. Einstein was trying to understand the nature of time. I mean, how much more philosophical can you get? Discovers this formula, E equals mt squared. It gives us the nuclear power, which might be keeping these lights on tonight. You know, very down-to-earth, practical discoveries come from just curiosity-driven desire for understanding. So, so I think it's great that there's a spectrum. And I never try to persuade colleagues who are psyched about a different part of it to do other things, because I think this, if we, if you don't want some kind of ontological monoculture. We don't want everybody running windows. We want to have different <laughs> approaches here. <laughs> well, as a Mac uh, user, I'll certainly agree with that. Uh, <laughs> but no, I, 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 I absolutely agree. I'm the odd man out here. I'm the only experimentalist. I'm the guy who works in the lab and tests these things. If somebody predicts something that is different from what quantum mechanics predicts, yeah then I'm really happy because I can go in the lab and I can find out whether that's right or not. And you know what gives an experimentalist the greatest pleasure? To prove that the theorists are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't matter. Someone's going to end up being wrong. Right. So that means no matter what, it's going to work out well for me. <laughs> because if there's two theories and they're different, then one of them's wrong. And I'm going to find out if I'm clever enough, or at least if my graduate students are clever enough. <laughs>